Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to an exciting demonstration of one of the most amazing and transformative medical devices that's emerging on the healthcare scene today. If this is the first time you're seeing this machine and its software, you will remember this day. My name is John Martin. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of 4Catalyzer, and I have the privilege of being joined today by some of the incredible people that are bringing this remarkable machine to market. Joining me today and leading the discussion is Dr. Khan Siddiqui. He's the Chief Medical and Strategy Officer of Hyperfine. He's joined by Brian Welch, Dr. Brian Welch, the Director of Clinical Science, and Samantha Bai, Dr. Samantha Bai, who is a clinical scientist also at Hyperfine. The Hyperfine journey began six years ago when its founder, Dr. Jonathan Rothberg, recruited some brilliant scientists and engineers and gave them a challenge. This challenge was driven by Jonathan's passion for democratizing healthcare and he wanted to do the same for MRI. He said, make it orders of magnitude more affordable, make it portable, make it easy to use, and then it'll be available to the masses, he said. Break MRI from the confines of those leaded rooms and unleash the power of magnetic imaging to a place that seems unimaginable to most of us in medicine, the bedside. Now, years later, with a team that's grown to more than 40 people, that challenge is being answered already in use in trials across six different institutions, in emergency rooms, neurointensive care units, and pediatric centers, with a waiting list of new users and new indications growing by the day. Today, we're going to demonstrate this device for you, review the technology and specifications, and highlight some of its remarkable features. But first, I want all of you to stop for a moment and imagine this scene. Unfortunately, this scene happens far too often. A child, maybe your son, is struck by a car while riding their bike. Loss of consciousness occurs and he's rushed to the hospital. You, unfortunately, rush to the hospital but are now stuck in an emergency room waiting room, sitting there waiting, anxiously waiting, no information. The nurses come out, they tell you, your son's now awake. He's conscious, but we're sending him off for a CT scan or an MRI but you can't go with him. You are sitting there alone in that waiting room. He's alone and you know he's scared. You desperately want to be with him to reassure him, to reassure you. Now imagine a different world. Now you're with your son in the emergency room, sitting with him in the bay and someone rolls in an MRI machine to your room. You get to stay with your son and imagine that study being performed with you right there comforting him holding his hand, that strength that comes from facing this terrible event together, that chases the way of the fears of the unknown. The images rapidly appear on the iPad the technologist is holding, and you slowly see that smile creep on that technologist's face as the images take form on the iPad. Can I see them, you ask. He shows you the scans. They don't mean anything to you, but there's comfort in seeing this done so seamlessly and effortlessly. This is how healthcare should be delivered, you immediately think. And this is how it's going to be delivered with this remarkable machine. Not just in emergency rooms, but at the bedside and in intensive care units and different sites that you could never imagine. Think how often we're in the neurointensive care unit or a critical care unit where we want to get a scan to assess changes in neural status. But we have to make that decision. Is it worth that risk to transport the patient and all the accompanying equipment to an MRI center? And can we really do that? Can we transport them to CT? What, what kind of complications can occur in that journey? All of that changes with this device. And this is how care is going to be delivered in this future with this remarkable machine. And I'd like to turn it over now to Khan, who can take us through the details of how this incredible device is being brought to the market and what makes it so special. Khan? I hope all of you are really good at reading lips because right now Khan is muted. And he's going <laughs> to tell us that you can bring this camera Thank you. anywhere and anytime. So simple and so easy to use. Thank you, John. Uh, as you guys all know, Dr. Martin mentioned, you know, this can be really spent six years perfecting this technology that can move to the patient's bedside uh, without any risk of metal projectiles or any of other aspects of it. So that it can be driven by anybody to the patient's bedside 
easily placed in and really plugged in in any of a, a wall outlet, no power, special power requirements necessary. I'm just going to walk through initially a little bit of features of the, of the device and then go into a demonstration in our mock IC out there. So here's what the device looks like. Uh, some of the features, it's a, it's a permanent magnet, a 64 milli, milli Tesla magnet. Um, you can see a brain neuro coil inside. I'll give you a more closer shot of that. Um, and it's uh, on wheels and casters, uh, can be driven uh, anywhere as needed. It only weighs uh, around 1400 pounds, so it can get on any elevator. It doesn't require a special elevator or any other task. The more important thing is that the five gauss line for the scanner is this yellow ring. So anything outside this, there is no risk of projectile as well as electromagnetic interference. Uh, the interesting thing that we have done is build noise cancellation technology that cancels out RF noise and RF signal and other interferences in the environment uh, to give us the perfect image every single time. The scanner is driven by a joystick, uh, easily controlled by anybody. Uh, and is controlled through a tablet interface. Here you see uh, one of our scientists using a tablet to scan a patient, a very easy to use as a tablet wirelessly connects to the scanner. Scanner itself also wirelessly connects to your local packs or cloud packs as needed. Here's a close up of the neuro coil uh, that uh, we have launched with initially. In the future, you will see other coils for other body parts. Uh, this is our, our, our initial launch application. And as I mentioned, we really made the user interface really simple. Anybody can use it. Um, and for today's demonstration, I'm, I'm located in Chicago. The scanner is in Guilford, Connecticut, near New Haven. I will be running the scan from here in Chicago, kind of showing an MR tech doesn't have to be next to the patient. Anybody can run it if there's a requirement that MR tech runs it. It can be run remotely also. Because of the wireless connectivity of the scanner, the images can show up if configured to anybody's uh, mobile device in a secure manner or a local packs. Uh, uh, scanner also can pull modality workless and, and orders can be done automatically. So let's go into the live demo. I'm gonna stop sharing screen and let's go into our- Can you yeah. pause on that a second? So you're actually sitting in Chicago. Correct. And you're gonna drive the scan that's sitting in Connecticut. Correct. Well, I, you've redefined social distancing for MRI for us there. That's really good. That's a pretty unique feature. Is that something that you see on any other device or is this unique to, to this device? It, this device was designed fundamentally to support this feature. So the, the people have done other kind of remote scanning too, but this was designed from day one to be able to, to accommodate remote scanning. In telehealth scenarios, remote scenarios where you need somebody to really do an image uh, and, and give expert opinion right away, it is, it is important to do this. So I think let's go into the demo and uh, have Dr. Brian Welsh drive the scanner in. Brian, all yours. So Brian's driving the scanner with the joystick, uh, bringing it into our uh, mock ICU room in our labs. Uh, he's deployed the Gauss guard that basically defines where the five Gauss line is, so no issues uh, bringing it in. It's very quiet, very easy to maneuver. He's going to position uh, the uh, scanner right along uh, the patient's bed. Then he's going to bring this bridge down, as you can see. And typically, if your uh, patient's bed are easily movable up and down, so you can move the patient bed up and down the line with that. Just to demonstrate the magnetic projectile issue, here's a lanyard, he's gonna put it in. That's how, that's how much pull it is. It's literally you have to be inside it to get a little bit pull and it's very easy to pull things out. It doesn't have any of the magnetic projectile risks that you typically see in an MR scanner. So you can use this in any room, what you're suggesting. In you don't need a fully leaded room at all. Correct, completely safe for any passive metal. So Brian's gonna plug the power. Uh, it's just very easy to plug it in. Um, one portion goes into the scanner, other one goes in any uh, wall outlet, 110 volts or 220 volts, there's no special wall outlet required. And he's gonna plug in the network jack here. Could be programmed to talk, do wireless Wi-Fi connectivity or through the ethernet. 
however is needed. And now we're going to, uh, here's the uh, control panel just to show how the scanner moves and the joystick on the left uh, is going to power it on. Great. So hardly any noise for it to turn on. What Brian's doing right now, he's putting some padding to make it comfortable for the patient. And again, it really depends on the scenarios um, and if a padding is needed or not, patient size also would make a difference. What's the smallest patient you've imaged so far, Con? Oh, the, our Brown University research folks have, have been uh, doing neonates. Uh, so far, our, our device is cleared from FDA currently for anybody two years and above, and we are pending approval for even neonates uh, right now. Correct. So do we, need, do we need to pause here and have Sam take off her watch? No, no need to do that. Sam can have her wallet, cell phone, watch in the pocket. Uh, no issues with any interference from that. So uh, Dr. Samantha B is ready to get scanned. If we are ready, boys, let's go. Chris, you want to switch to the other view? Perfect. And literally very easy. Uh, any nurse or anybody can just pick the patient's bed sheet and slide the patient in. If the patient is awake, they can hold a handlebar on the scanner and just pull themselves in too. All right, while Sam is uh, getting comfortable there, I'm going to connect to the scanner and uh, start, start the scan. So Brian's plugging in the pulse oximeter, showing no, no issues with interference from anything. Any special training needed to run the scanner? Huh? So the team trains uh, anybody that is needed uh, for a few hours uh, when we come in, but we've had sites that from delivery to scanning have done the scan the same day. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly, one of our researchers have been trained their four-year-old to know how to run the scanner. So literally anybody from, uh, uh, you know, residents, interns, assistants, you know, MR techs, nurses can run the scanner. So let me share my screen and then we'll, we'll start the scan. So it's very simple user interface. I'm just going to add some information. Again, this, if it was modality workless was enabled, uh, we can uh, pull the, all this information through there. Uh, that's all I need. And again, very simple interface. It's in plug and play. Uh, we have some predefined protocols that are all established based on clinical indications. These can be customized per site. Uh, I'll use a fast scan right now. And it's very easy to change. So if I want to remove certain, let me start the scan and I'll show. So initially we'll do a pre-calibration scan just to understand what the noise uh, environment is and then correct automatically for that. Um, the sound is on in the ICU, so if there's any noise that is coming in from the scanner, you'll hear it right away. So let's remove this T1 sequence. This kind of shows you how long the scan time is going to be. Um, and then uh, you can go to sequences. There are a lot of options available. If you want to do diffusion rated imaging, flare, uh, I'm just going to add a, um, a T2 coronal to this. Uh, and uh, maybe a sagittal also. Well, let's do the scan and then we'll see how it goes. Once the scan is done, we do immediate uh, iterative uh, scan development. So meaning that you'll start seeing images show up immediately when only 10% of the scan is started. That's the noise you hear from the scanner. It's really, really quiet. Uh, and then you can visualize the images uh, right on the scanner. Uh, <clears throat> 
This kind of shows you what the total scan time is going to be from the sequences that I've selected, some links on uh, information, even the uh, launching packs directly from here can be configured also. There's some uh, information from troubleshooting point of view, um, and then some of the specs on uh, the gradients and uh, amplifiers for the scanner and how they are. So let's go back to the exam. About 20 some seconds left. So we got some questions from the audience, Khan. Can you change these parameters on the presets or are they fixed? So we, well, for the clinical use point of view, they are fixed. Uh, we can configure them and deployment time to whatever is needed, but to make it very simple, easy to use, uh, we've pre-created pre these uh, for ease of use purposes. Yeah. And there's something special about the noise cancellation you do here as well, isn't there? Isn't that worth bringing out? Correct. So we have a bunch of different sensors are all around the scanner that actually uh, look for RF noise and cancel it out so that we don't have interference during the scan. So I'm going to resume the scan to start our T2 weighted imaging, axial images. And uh, you will start noticing uh, images start to show up uh, as soon as uh, you know, partial acquisition is done. Acquisition is all in 3D, so you, we're, we're capturing all the information uh, at the same time. So I think there's a question about uh, how many Tesla this unit is. So it's a 64 milli Tesla or 0 0.064 Tesla scanner. Ryan, how's our patient doing in there? She's doing great. Her pulse is steady. I can see her pulse ox during the scan. No interference with that device, that patient monitor. She's very comfortable. We've got a foot um, rest on her, or knee rest, so she's comfortable. She's probably taking a nap. So the quiet. question... She doesn't have any ear protection because it's so quiet. She doesn't need it. And there's a question about how the transfer happens to the PACs. So we connect to typical DICOM. Um, uh, connectivity to any PAC system. Uh, Hyperfine also provides its own PACs environment if a site needs it, uh, and that is available through a cloud application. So it really depends on the site if they want to um, uh, send to a local PACs or, uh, or, uh, or our PACs that we provide as part of a solution. So, um, so, so you start seeing the partial scan has already started. So image is building as more and more acquisition has happened. So every 10% of acquisition, 20% acquisition, you start seeing quality improve of these, uh, uh, of these scans. While the scan is happening, we can keep answering a few more questions. Uh, there's a question that if the quick Q&A is available after the demo, yes, as, uh, as similar to previous uh, webinars we've done, we will post these questions and email to all those who were registered to the link to where the Q&A uh, are. So no worry about that if you missed it. So Khan, looking at these images right now, so we're, yep. we've just gotten started. If there was a big bleed, you would see this now, correct? Absolutely, if there was any mass effect, mass shift happening, something like that, you would immediately see it. So literally in an emergency scenario, you would just stop a scan and, uh, and take the person to whatever uh, procedures needed after that. So I guess if we're thinking of someone with an acute stroke and a neurologic deficit, we could make that decision right here, whether or not mm -hmm. thrombolytic therapy or some kind of intervention is appropriate based on the presence of a large bleed. So if something, bleed, something big is there, you'll immediately see it. Uh, you know, typically, you would wait for diffusion rated imaging if you're looking for a small, smaller lesion, but something big will really be obvious uh, uh, on these images. And what size would you say? So if we were saying you're going to target, what size lesion are you going to see with this with the 64 milli Tesla system? So our resolution is about 1.2 millimeter in plane resolution and um, uh, five millimeter slice thickness right now. So anything larger than that, we should be able to see. In our clinical sites, the smallest we've seen is about a centimeter lesion. We have never not imaged anybody below that yet, but that's the, that's the limitation of this we have. It's a good size when you think about how big a, a deficit, if you will, that you see on DWI, where you would actually take somebody for an intervention. So. Uh, it, it actually yeah. has, there's a really good question that's posed here, and that is, in any of the quality studies that you've done so far, have in, the images there had any impact on clinical decision-making? 
Yeah, that happens all the time, especially in our some of the COVID sites that are using it more in the clinical capacity rather than research capacity. They are making decisions on one third um, of the patients. Management is changing because of what they see on the scan. Um, the question is, I'm answering this question live on the ED use. So there are a couple of sites that are currently uh, using it in emergency department um, uh, to assess, uh, assess stroke. Um, and uh, more sites, uh, more welcome. That's a very obvious use case, especially in wake up stroke scenarios where you don't know the duration of the symptom of the patient. MR is now the uh, primary indication, uh, primary modality to, to screen those patients for that. Yeah, I mean, we have diffusion weighted. So the question is about diffusion weighted sequence. Can we develop for this um, scanner? We already have uh, diffusion weighted imaging and ADC map uh, that is available in the scanner as an our clinical evaluation uh, has been uh, considered clinically acceptable. So, um, uh, uh, you know, again, this new technology, we'll, we'll learn a lot more uses and indications as it's deployed in clinical use. There was a question about uh, whether or not we're considering veterinary use for the device. I, and I, I say this with, with the dog sitting on my lap right now, trying desperately to keep her quiet. <laughs> I think we get those questions a lot. Um, I think definitely in the future, those are the applications where we will expand our business. Right now, we're focusing on human use um, uh, only. And what's, what sites do you envision using this device? So you, we, we talked about the emergency department and a neurointensive care unit. What other locations are you envisioning? I think this, the, this form factor really enables two scenarios. Main scenario is portability and access, right? So scenarios where patients are difficult to move or scenarios where there's just no way to put a dedicated MR scanner, right? So you can imagine in urgent care centers, you can imagine these in, uh, in uh, sports scenarios, you can imagine in, um, uh, in retail scenarios where the scanner now is where the patient is. The idea really is to make the patient the center uh, and, and convert imaging into a patient-centric imaging where instead of the patient coming to the scanner, the scanner is actually going to the patient. So it really opens up opportunities beyond what is, um, uh, is out there. So let's see where we are with our exam. So scan is now finished the T2, it's going through the reconstruction aspect of it. And while it's doing the finishing of reconstruction on the axial, the chrono scan is already uh, started. So there's no need to wait for it. So as soon as this quality improves, I can start showing uh, some of the images. So let's go to an axial. One of the things I'm noticing, Khan, on this webinar is the noise I'm hearing from the scanner is actually louder than what I typically hear when I'm in the room. I, I guess that's a function of the microphone from the webinar. Yeah, it's right on top of the scanner. That's why yeah, you're okay. hearing it. I'm going to say, this is louder than what I usually recognize here. Usually you walk by the room, you can hardly tell it's on. Yeah, exactly. So while the scan is happening, here's the coronal scans to start to show up. So, I mean, you can see the image quality, right? With these T2 axial images, pretty good. Uh, perfect normal brain, uh, Dr. Sambi's brain. <clears throat> no issues here. And then if you go back to our, <clears throat> you start seeing coronal data sets show up as soon as 20% uh, of the scan is complete. Let's, let's do some more questions while the scan is happening, John. So let me ask this question and I'll mm -hmm. ask this one to Brian. Brian, you've been in the hospital and you and, and Dr. B have been in the hospital a number of times. What's been the staff response to, to this device? We all know that in the intensive care units, the people that really run the, new, the, the units are the nurses, not the doctors. So what has been their response to the device? Uh, the reception's been very positive. A lot of times when people first see it, their uh, jaws drop, especially when we tell them what it is. It's a portable MRI, and they say they've seen everything now. Uh, but um, it's been a very positive reception. Uh, 
We've been to neuro ICUs, ED departments, outpatient clinics, uh, even uh, research labs, and everyone uh, enjoys that it's easy to drive, uh, those that learn how to drive it, and uh, it's very easy to pick up and intuitive to, to operate. Um, also, we've had a good reception from family members um, and patients uh, who uh, would normally not really like the idea of going away from their room to for an MRI scan. When they see the scanner, they're relieved that, uh, of the size, that it's small. Uh, and family members like that they can stay nearby um, and stay in the room and hold the hand of their loved one while they get scanned. You know, we talk about that almost in a theoretical sense, but I think I remember a really special case where they were going to use a, a standard MR and couldn't because of movement. Do you want to tell that story? Yes, yes, that happened at the Advanced Baby Imaging Lab um, in Rhode Island at Brown University. Uh, they, they don't like to put the, the babies there under sedation or anesthesia, so they wait till they're tired and they feed them and swaddle them and they take a nap when they go for their three Tesla scan. Well, we were there on a day when a little three-month-old girl, um, three -month -old girl uh, would not go down for her nap, and so they had to abandon the uh, three Tesla scan, but they thought, okay, we'll try the hyperfine scan. And so the, the three month old girl, she stayed awake the entire time, but her mother was able to pacify her by standing next to her and stroking her and even let her daughter chew on her finger during the hyperfine scan. So we got a nice quality five minute long T2 weighted scan of this three month old baby while she was awake, uh, staring up into her mother's eyes the entire time. So that day we beat three Tesla. <laughs> Very good. Um, can we do the poll, Chris? And there's a request for a DWI scan, so I'm going to put that in the, next in the queue. Wait, I don't get to vote. Why don't I get to vote? What is, what is this? <laughs> No, no, John, we've disabled your ability to work here. I don't want you to influence these questions. Hey, Brian, how big is this? So are, are, is it fitting into standard rooms? Have you had any issue with moving it through hallways into elevators, into rooms? There's been a question about, will it fit? How, do, how does it compare, say, to a portable x-ray machine that runs around the hospital? Yeah, so it's it's uh, four foot nine inches tall. Um, so uh, it's it's not that tall, and width wise, it's just over thirty four inches wide. So almost any standard thirty six inch wide door frame is going to go through. Um, some of the older buildings we've been in, we've had to get a little creative. But for modern hospitals and ICUs where the doorways are plenty big, uh, you know, for for oversized wheelchairs and those sort of things, we have no problem at all. Uh, we go up and down to elevators all the time. We go from the sixth floor to the seventh floor at Yale. We go from the sixth floor down to the ED at Yale all the time. Uh, so, so far, it's been pretty easy to get in and out of buildings. Uh, we do like to stick to, to level floors. We can tolerate ramps up to five degrees. Uh, otherwise, we like to stay on level floors. So are there any safety precautions that you have to make in going through hallways and stuff? I noticed uh, a now, yellow hula hoop there. I didn't know that you're taking that off to entertain yourself while the scan is going on, or does that actually have safety value? Yeah, so when that hula hoop is fully expanded, that demarks the boundary of the five Gauss line, which is an important boundary in MRI. So as long as you keep unscreened people, members of the public outside of that boundary, it's five foot two across, 62 inches across, they should be perfectly safe because that is beyond, uh, outside of the five Gauss boundary. Nothing that's in their body should, should be uh, reacting to the magnetic field. And that's also not posed an issue for you in all these different hospital settings that you've been in so far? No, it hasn't been a problem. Uh, we, we've used this in busy emergency departments in Brooklyn and on Long Island. Um, we've uh, moved it through the IC unit when other patients are walking past it with an oxygen tank behind them. No problem at all. There's no risk of projectile effects with this, with this uh, week of a field. Um, and uh, passive metal that might be in a person's body is also not a concern. It's not going to heat up even if they're the subject being scanned our wavelength is just simply too long to create any heating effects uh, in passive metal. The only thing you want to check when you're a user is if there's active implants, you need to look at the MRI safety labeling for that particular device. And many of those devices will be safe at our field strength, but you just got to check the labeling. And any specific safety protocols that you put in place for this compared to, compared to uh, any other situations? So the sites that started with us, they, they began with the standard uh, MRI screening uh, because that was familiar to them and that was already a, a well-known procedure at their locations. And as, as time has passed, they've gotten more comfortable, more confident. They know there are some things like passive metal that are safe. 
Um, they do know that they need to look out for certain active implants and check on the, the details of the safety labeling. Um, so they started with their standard MRI screening, and as they got more confident and comfortable, uh, they um, relaxed that a bit to take into account the safety of the lower field strength and, and the lower RF power. So Con, you came onto the scene a little bit later, and I know we'll get to the poll here in a second. What surprised you the most when you got here, when you saw this? What, what was the biggest aha moment for you? I, I thought it was a very fantastical idea. It was more fantasy that it, physics just doesn't allow this kind of imaging happening on such a low Tesla image. So that was completely, I had to see it to believe it kind of scenario. And then I was totally blown away when the team uh, showed me the images. Uh, when I first visit, visited the scanner, it was, uh, it was mind boggling. I'm a Pete, I did most of my work in pediatric MR. So, you know, used to sedating kids and uh, and even anesthesia to kids or, you know, it just seeing those babies being imaged with just holding their mom's hand was just, uh, just, you know, blew my mind. <laughs> I mean, you know, I used to be director of MR at University of Maryland, right? So the fights I used to always have with uh, staff, you know, bringing ICU patients down. And it used to be a full expedition, right? You need to bring not only the patient, but all the equipment, the nurses and somebody else coming down and, uh, and somebody has to manage all the patients that are not being managed by the nurse from the unit who's downstairs. So it used to be a huge, huge expedition just to get anybody from the ICU image. And again, you know, they're always late, something else happened, scanner sitting empty waiting for them. So just those, those scenarios kind of go away in this, uh, in this use case. A lot of time, especially in the ICU scenarios, we don't do serial imaging because of these region and rely, the reasons and rely on you know, clinical symptoms more or other ways to understand status of person stroke or other conditions. Um, but here, you can just put the scanner patient room and keep imaging again and again uh, to see what is happening. So you wanna talk about the poll results? So, um, so if you look at the poll results, and I, I, think if we, I think everyone has the ability to see these, if not, uh, the Neuro ICU came in first, but there was a close second with the emergency department, 37% to 31. Yeah. Pediatrics, I was a little bit, I'm a little surprised by this, came in a third at 23% and stroke rehab at 9%. Uh, interesting. Are you surprised at all by these results? No, I mean, I thought Pete's would be a little bit more than that, just being, again, I'm biased from my experience. But yeah, these are the most common scenarios in acute care settings. I mean, we didn't ask about non acute care settings in this, in this poll, and I'm sure people had a lot of other interesting ideas where they would use the scanner. Yeah, it's interesting. We talk a little bit about the opportunity in the developing world uh, because of the incidence of hydrocephalus. Have, have we had any experience with that yet? Yeah, we have a clinical site at the um, University of Pennsylvania that is actually studying hydrocephalus um, uh, for um, uh, on our MR imaging, as well as um, there are a bunch of other foundations that are that have uh, bought scanners for from us to understand how to self list related issues in uh, limited resource countries. So yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to go through the coronal data set that we acquired for Dr. Bay. So looks pretty good. Diffusion imaging is almost done. Partial partial data acquired so far. So how sensitive, Brian, maybe you can answer this. Uh, how sensitive is the machine to power fluctuations? Well, we, um, we operate off, off standard power outlets and uh, we just need one 10 volts and uh, 15 amps. We actually use, use much lower than that in terms of the max amperage. I would say that if you were in a situation where the power quality was a, was a question, we are actually able to operate off of uh, battery packs that uh, you, can, you can buy off the shelf. And we've done that here in the lab. And we're actually planning to have that as a backup solution for some of our developing world, low middle income country sites. So if you did think that your power might fluctuate, we can very easily uh, run off battery packs uh, that would have nice clean power. Uh, there are uh, very robust medical grade power supplies uh, at, in the bottom part of the scanner. Every, all the electronics are down there. There's no hidden electronics. You're seeing everything in front of you on the broadcast. That's a fully self-contained 
uh, MRI scanner there. Uh, and Brian, so, we've, we've also run the scan on a gen, power generator too, right? So yes, and gas yep. power generator you could also. Yeah, you just we you can run off a gas power generator. We've done it here at the lab. You just want to make sure that the generator is set that it'll uh, not go into power saving mode. It'll work just fine. So the only thing left to test now is solar and wind power to run this thing, right? right. Is that the other two you got left? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're two different cyclists. Uh, <laughs> wasn't my working. We'll be the Flintstones and have a bicycle next to the to the machine, and you can and you can ride your bike and power your MR machine at the same time. Yeah, we we use anywhere from 200 uh, to up to a peak of 900 watts. That's that's the peak. Typically about 300 watts, which one of those cyclists could do pretty easily. Yeah, that's how much a coffee maker uses, right? So there's a lot of questions here, Brian and Khan, about sensitivity compared to CT um, and, and to, to a 1.5 Tesla system. How do you want to answer that for acute stroke or hemorrhage? I mean, I think the early, the, the way I would answer is that, you know, 64 milli Tesla, the, the Toshiba diasonic scanners used to be the same uh, field strength. And um, um, we haven't done any specific studies to compare a particular sensitivity of lesions to date. I know there are a bunch of different clinical sites that are interested in studying that aspect of it. Um, but, you know, so far when we've, we've done comparison of different types of lesions, we've seen pretty compatible uh, lesion morphology between um, 1.5 and, um, uh, and our uh, scanner. So I think uh, obviously being a very low field strength, there is contrast differences in how the lesions look and things like that. But overall morphologically, there sh should be no difference. I, this is a really important point I think that we, we should pause on. And that is, first of all, we've always had this burning desire to have better and better image quality. And it makes sense. You know, it's, it's obviously a crystal clear picture to watch football when we used to be able to do it and see the little beads of rubber bounce up off the field was kind of cool. But at the end of the day, if it was a touchdown, you could see it was a touchdown on your old black and white scan, whether or not the beads were there. And I think the question really now with this, with the affordability and versatility and portability this device has, we ask the question, how good does the image need to be to answer the question? And yeah, I think exactly. that's really the distinction now. Yeah, we never intended to replace um, the MR scanner. Our goal was really, hey, there's a portable uh, X-ray exists. You know, we, that doesn't replace your X-ray in, in the basement. There's a portable CT exists. Why not portable MR? Same scenarios where access is limited. You know, you can imagine the scanner in the ambulance. You can imagine the scanner in the space station. You can imagine the scanner on a cruise ship, right? So those scenarios where portability and accessibility become more important than the fine details that you, you would need in a tertiary care setting scenario. So, yeah, and I think one of the things that Brian's demonstrating so nicely being there is the fact that you could have a patient roll into the emergency room beyond the scanner while you're measuring their blood pressure, putting an IV in, and, uh, and literally almost getting them undressed, all of that could be done essentially at the exact same time. Yep. So how's our patient? Sam, how you feel? How the images look? Am I good? Nice. Yeah. It's yeah, very good. fun our reconstruction of these diffuse images. It, it could be the most brilliant brain we've ever seen, Sam. Thank and you. Diffusion data set almost done. And I just want to point out for those of you familiar with the fusion weight imaging, uh, we are not using echo cleaner readout, so we don't have to saturate our fat signal. So you do see the fat around the rim of the, the head, uh, that bright white signal. Um, and we're doing this with a fast spin echo based sequence. The B value is about 800 uh, seconds per millimeter squared. What does maintenance look like for this guy? How does it compare to traditional imaging systems? I can take that. So everything down sure. below in the um, where the electronics are is, is designed to be modular. So the grinning amplifiers, the RF amplifier, all these things are modular. So if they were to fail, uh, they're very easy to replace. Uh, we've had scanners running in the field for more than a year and not had to replace any of those electronics. Uh, but when that does happen, uh, we intend it to be very simple and easy, uh, possibly even to just ship the, the modular amplifier uh, to the site and have someone local do the swap right then and there. This is much different than conventional high field MRI where one, just one of those grading amplifiers might weigh 100 pounds. Uh, these, these amplifiers uh, are, are uh, fit in your hands and, and weigh less than 10 pounds. What's a cleaning protocol? Has this been used at all in, in this era of COVID? 
Brian? I mean, you've been out there, Khan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brian, why don't you answer that one too? Yeah, so when people clean, uh, they want to focus on the padding that we provide to them, also the bridge and the pulse shoes and inside the coil, also the top pulse shoe, especially if it's a COVID patient where they might have been coughing. So pretty much these surfaces where the patient can come into contact or anywhere else that the patient may have touched. Uh, we use the Super Sandy cloths, the purple top wipes. Um, we have had a few uh, body fluid spills uh, at the ICU, uh, not the fault of the scanners, just you know stitches came open or something like that. Uh, in that case, they, um, they would use the bleach wipes and wipe everything down very carefully with that. So um, uh, wiping and cleaning, it takes just a few minutes. And one thing just to point out, John, as you're thinking about, right, Brian had the iPad controller sitting on top of the scanner while I was also connected to the scanner, running the scanner. So imagine a scenario where some expert may be sitting in the radiology department, whereas nurse could be sitting with the patient, and they both would be able to see what is going on with the patient. He's also sure sharing that, replicating that with the large screen also, so you can see the same images over there. So um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty intuitive and easy to use and addresses a lot of scenarios and issues that come up in an acute care setting. So we look at this and I mean, listen, I think all of us that have been around and seen this device and, and I, I've been at a, a few shows before the world shut down, everybody walks away just stunned. But what are the hurdles? Where, where do we see is the problems? You know, no new invention, no new medical device is perfect. There are obviously yeah. learnings that we've had along the way of being inside hospitals. Why don't we share some of the hurdles that we still have to overcome and some of the questions uh, that are yet to be answered? Brian, you want, you want to take that too? Yeah, you want to start with that, Brian? I can tell you about the checklist that we'd like to send to sites to get them ready for the scanner. So the first, the first item of the checklist is where are you going to store the scanner? Um, especially if you want to keep it nearby in the ICU or nearby the ED, you do need to have a spot for, for the scanner. Fortunately, you only need about a four foot by four foot spot on the floor. We do like it to be in a, in a controlled area that's not accessible by the general public. If, if you can't find an area like that, we actually do have a, a scanner garage uh, that you can park it in. We use that at the Yale ED uh, that closes up around it and contains the five gauss line and is locked. So first, first question is where are you going to store it? Uh, the second question answer is who's going to be the driver of the scanner? Um, and even though it's very simple to learn how to drive it, but it, every hospital and site's going to... Oh, we lost Brian. So let's see if he does back, uh, joins back in from the room. So, Khan, you said your background was in pediatric MR. Correct. And so you've been around this device now with your colleagues, all yeah. of whom probably were naysayers that this wasn't going to work. What's been their response and how, how have they interacted with you now that you've taken on this role? It's been, um, it's been pretty fascinating to see, see this and the demand coming in. I get calls pretty much on a daily basis from asking for, uh, for a scanner and unit immediately, especially for <laughs> neonatal indications. We'll, we're hoping to get our neonatal approval uh, later in this year uh, and can't wait to have these going to pediatric sites. We have some deployments coming in in pediatric hospitals in the next couple of months. So as, as imaging is done over there, we'll be talking about it and I'm sure we'll do a webinar on neonatal and pediatric imaging pretty soon. What's the weight limits on the machine itself? I think the weight limit is around 400, uh, uh, 400 pounds as the bridge uh, that can handle that much uh, weight. So uh, it's pretty heavy patients can go in for this, uh, for the scan. And is this an app that runs it? Do you download an app from the Apple store? Or does it come on the iPad? How does that function? It's running on a browser. So I was running on my uh, computer on a Chrome browser and, and Brian was running on an iPad on a Safari browser. So it doesn't require a Spanish app downloads. So, so you, you just actually, how do you log into the system then to do that? What is the technical way? To, I mean, I can't jump yeah. on my phone right now and run this, right? No, so it's running, you know, obviously it's gonna run inside the hospital network. Uh, okay. We set up all the accounts and everything that is needed to log into the device and whoever needs those accounts are set up as a part of uh, implementation of the device. And before I forget, because you know, I'm a vascular surgeon and we forget things all the time. Uh, we're not as smart as radiologists. How are people can get information and maybe get on the waiting list or, you know, get in line. Can people buy this machine now? So uh, they can go to haverfine.io and uh, there's an option to pre-order the scan now uh, for delivery in September, October timeframe. So um, yeah, absolutely. You can do that. They can put more information in. We can reach out can to you hear us? them. Yes, we can hear you now. Brian, can you hear us? 
Yes, I can hear you. Are we back with you? Can you hear us? Yep. Yep. Sorry about that. Our, our Zoom room calendar uh, ended at 2.45 p.m. on the dot, so we're back now. <laughs> um, I don't know if Con picked up where I left off. I was just going through the checklist. It's usually storage. Who's going to drive it? Yep. Who's, who's going to operate the scanner? Um, we do like to be on the network uh, in order to access our cloud packs or uh, to access the local hospital packs and the modality work list. So you have to get us on the network. Um, and uh, then you just have to decide who's going to be ordering these exams and, and just the workflow of, of who's going to be helping get patients in and out, uh, like at ICU. Uh, usually it's the primary nurse with some assistance from colleagues. Those are the main hurdles. Awesome. I think we are over our time. Uh, there are more questions. We can keep going uh, for a while. Otherwise, um, we can um, end it here. Well, let, let's leave with one of the most interesting questions of all. How much does this cost? <laughs> it is extremely cheap uh, compared to your traditional MR scanner. It's less than the maintenance contract you would have for a traditional scanner. Um, we have two different models. One is a more subscription model. So anywhere between $7,000 a month to $5,000 a month, depending on how many scanners and duration of the contract. Uh, and if somebody wants to buy it, uh, outright, uh, there's a hardware uh, purchase price of $50,000 and then a uh, software license on top of it for again, four to $5,000 a month. Uh, and then that includes everything, maintenance, support, software upgrades, uh, any other sequences that are coming out, unlimited cloud storage, um, pack, packs access, if you don't have yours, all of the above included. Wow, that's a little bit different than a million and a half bucks for a machine and another half a million for a room. Really, our goal really is to reduce cost to the system and make it really cheap that, uh, you know, it, it's no brainer to use. So people can get on a waiting list now. What's the kind of time frame for when we're going to start seeing these roll out of the, the hyperfine uh, manufacturing process so people can have them in their, in their hospitals and start planning accordingly? So we are rolling out in limited capacity right now. Uh, we're focusing initially on our research customer that we've uh, uh, partnered with. And then uh, later in this fall, we will start shipping commercially. We, by the time our second 510K for unit will also be done. So we will use ship scanners uh, with, the, with expanded indications. Well, I, I think this has been a remarkable demonstration. I, I, I certainly know that uh, it certainly exceeds the imagination of most people when they picture an MRI. And I think the clinical scenarios are there. The applicability is there. I think the value proposition, you know, one of the things that's really interesting with COVID is you got hospital systems all across the planet uh, that, have, that have been crushed with COVID and are looking for ways to have a different economic plan inside their hospital. And this is certainly one. Sam, any, any other comments you might that you've been in a lot of these different ICUs and we want you to be more than just a, a patient here today. You've had great experience. Anything that's been unique for you and, and your extensive experience that you'd like to share before we close? Um. Our experience at Yale has just been phenomenal. We worked with um, their neurointensive care unit group there. The nurses are active there. Research assistants are actually running this scanner, so it's not trained technologists. Um, so just seeing it all come together and seeing who can be scanned in this unique environment is really tremendous. And I think it'll really open a lot of opportunities in the future to see um, different things that you're normally not able to see because of how much work it really takes to bring a patient to a typical high field MRI scanner. So I'm looking forward to exploring more of these scenarios. Okay, before we end up, uh, our next um, uh, webinar is on uh, portable MR in emergency medicine. It's on July 30th, uh, same time at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, to register, there's a link below. Uh, it'll also be available on our website uh, in the near future. So again, just go to go.hyperfine.io emergency webinar 2020 to register for the next one. Thank you, John, for uh, amazing moderating the session. And thank you, Brian and Sam, for uh, participating in the demonstration. I uh, hope we answered the question. And again, just a reminder that we will be posting answers to all the questions asked on our website uh, in the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.